Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the founder of the 311 Institute and the World Futures Forum, and welcome to Accenture's Digital Summit. Now, as a futurist, I look at two kinds of futures. I look at the next 20 years, which is where the vast majority of organizations spend their time planning. So that's sort of three, five, 10, 20 year sort of time frame. But I also look at deep futures, 20 to 50 years out, because if you're a sovereign government, you typically care about that too. Particularly when we start talking about the future of education, jobs, skills, transportation, infrastructure, healthcare, the welfare state, and all these other kinds of activities and topics. Now, during this presentation, we're gonna be having some serious fun, and you'll see what I mean by that as we sort of go through it. Um, but consider this, you know, today we're all being disrupted. You know, 12 months ago, I used to walk around these things called stages. Then we had the pandemic and all of a sudden I was presenting to audiences around the world via my virtual studio. Now, as we start progressing, I'm now starting to appear to you, for example, in Accenture's invitation as an augmented reality avatar, a kind of hologram. But when we start having a look at what comes after augmented reality holograms, I just think it's holograms. So here's a real hologram from BYU over in the US. Here at BYU, in the holography group, we are working to create the displays of science fiction. Displays like the holodeck from Star Trek or the Princess Leia projector from Star Wars. So most displays, including 3D displays, require you to look at a screen. But our technology creates images that are floating out in space and they're physical. So, these holograms, you can consider these holograms to be the granddaddy of the Blade Runner 2049 holographic dancing ballerina advert. Yeah, these are created using a whole variety of different methods, you know, lasers, optical traps, and so on and so forth. But these are the real deal. There's no augmented reality. There's no glass. There's no fakery involved in these things. These are real. And today, they're tiny, but they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're going to get higher resolution over time. Just like all technologies, it'll get better, it'll get cheaper, and all of a sudden you'll find them everywhere. Um, now, when Accenture first contacted me to do this presentation, you know, they said to me, Matt, you know, we want you to do something out of this world. And I thought, well, you know, most people are really just happy with me appearing in these tiny little Zoom windows. I mean, and those Zoom windows are convenient for me because you can't really see what I'm doing. Plus, I don't even have to wear trousers on a Zoom call. So, you know, I was a little bit sort of put out. But I didn't want to let Accenture down, so I thought, well, okay, how would I actually do something that's truly out of this world? So, having a little think about it, I gave my friend Richard Branson a call. I wrote a couple of articles on him a couple of years ago, and I thought, maybe, you know, I, I could just get a ride, basically, on Virgin Galactic's new space plane. And he was really, really accommodating. I mean, you know, hats off to Sir Richard. Um, so, as I'm taking laps, especially around the universe, sort of trying to think what I can really show you all, you know, it really struck me as we circled the Earth, NASA have got this perspective, they call it the orbital perspective. You know, when you get to a distance of about 18,000 miles away from Earth, it just appears as this tiny pale blue dot hanging in the void of space. And when you think about it, your entire lives are lived on that dot. Everything you experience is on that dot. Everyone you love is on your dot. And as the human race, we've been through a huge amount, basically, over the, next, over the last 12 months. And so, my first piece of advice is, as we start looking at the end of this pandemic, take time out for yourself. Because, frankly, we've all had too much time to watch Netflix. So what's next? What do you feel when you say the word I? Make a choice, right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. It's like it's water. It wants to move. It wants to move and go around stuff. You know. If you decide to drop your buckets where you are and develop your gifts, 
I grant you, you'll never ever be without. I grant you that your gifts will take you places that will literally amaze you. So decide that you're going to take some time to work on you, that you deserve that from yourself, that your life deserves some prime time because you are creating your own production. You are the star of your show. You are the director. You're writing the script. And you will determine whether your life is a smash office hit or flop. I'm going to work. I'm going to press forward. I'm going to learn. I'm going to do everything in my power. Every single day, I'm going to do everything in my power to become a victor and not a victim. Winners win and losers lose. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And once you've taken time out for yourself, once you've given your employees extra time off, bearing in mind everything that we've been through, the opportunities that you face are going to be staggering. Now, when we have a look at the different technologies that we can combine together, there are over 450 exponential, powerful technologies you can combine together to disrupt every industry, every product, every corner, every conceivable part, basically, of culture and society as we know it today. We have 3D printing, for example, that disrupts the $10 trillion manufacturing sector. In addition to that, we have new computing platforms coming through. In 2025, you'll all be able to use quantum computers that are hundreds of millions of times faster than traditional classical computers. And when it comes to things like risk management, risk matrices, supply chains, these things are absolutely perfect for that kind of stuff. Um, in addition to that, you know, when we have a look at the communication side of things, we are connecting everyone on the planet in the next 10 years. That doubles your addressable opportunity thanks to low Earth orbit satellites and HAP systems. We have 5G, basically, which is a quantum leap over 4G, which will help you create immersive experiences in real time anywhere you happen to be. In addition to that, we have artificial intelligence, which is increasingly ubiquitous. We have 3D printed AIs. We have made AIs out of DNA. We literally live in a sci-fi world already. I don't even have to make sci-fi up. I can just repeat fact. Um, when we have a look at soft robots, we've got molecular robots that are starting to create new electric vehicle batteries. They are the first molecular assemblers. When we have a look at security paradigms, we've got robo-hackers that will hack your systems 100 million times faster than any human hacker can. And then when we start talking about user experiences, of course, we've got augmented reality, virtual reality, neural interfaces, and all kinds of things. We even have the technology today to allow ALS patients to stream their thoughts to YouTube using brain-machine interfaces and artificial intelligence technologies. We literally live in a sci-fi world, and as an organization, you are surrounded by sci-fi startups. They play by fundamentally different rules. And get this, Irrespective of what industry you sit in, what industry you play in, what industry you want to play in, everything is being disrupted. Every industry is being disrupted, and they're being disrupted faster than ever before. The agricultural industry, we've got vertical farms that can grow eight times the amount of crops for 99% less water, 100% less chemicals and herbicides and pesticides. We can literally take a feather from a chicken thanks to clean meat technologies and we can feed the world. We can take one cell from one chicken and we can put that into a bioreactor and we can grow meat for everybody. Farming, food production is fundamentally being disrupted in new ways. In addition to that, when we have a look at energy, we are now increasingly talking about using blockchain to create peer-to-peer -peer autonomous electric vehicle grids. We are using virtual power plants. We have over a trillion watts of renewable energy installed. When we have a look at solar, solar panels today are about 17% efficient. We've got a pathway to 132% efficiency with black silicon. We even have solar panels that work at night, so say goodbye to grid-scale storage. 
Uh, when we have a look at the financial services sector, we've got decentralized finance. Basically, we've got cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and blockchain. Basically, we've got CBDCs. Uh, we have robo-advisors. We have all kinds of things. When we have a look at healthcare, we've got telehealth, telepsychiatry. We've got artificial intelligence treatment systems and diagnosis systems. We can do in vivo gene editing where we can literally clip out the faulty genes in someone with an inherited genetic disease, clip in new genes, and they are cured. And when you have a look at the vaccines, the COVID vaccines that have been produced, artificial intelligence, genomics, gene editing, and supercomputers mean that we haven't taken 10 years to create a vaccine. We've taken eight months. That is accelerating like crazy. Um, and then finally, but definitely not last, uh, when we have a look at the transportation industry, you know, everything is going electric, everything is going autonomous. We're taking the operators out of cars. If you take an operator out of a car and you take the dashboard away, the pedals and the steering wheel, you don't have a car, you've got a pod. So fundamentally, BMW, Audi and all these other organizations are increasingly looking at the death of the car. And that's before we get to Mach 1 Hyperloops and all kinds of other types of crazy sort of uh, travel technologies, basically like rockets, whoever wants to use one of those. Um, so anyway, welcome to my base. I mean, I haven't really properly introduced you basically to my habitat here. I'm actually in the sort of the, the lower left-hand habitat here. Um, when I landed on the moon, I actually used a couple of Earth technologies. Uh, so I used 3D printing to make my habitat. You can 3D print a four bed house for 25,000 euros in a day. Normally that would take about three to six months to create a four bed house and it would cost you about 200,000 euros. The construction industry is also being disrupted. Now, I must admit, basically, sort of, you know, I spent the first day on the moon. I, I sort of built my habitat. I really needed some advice on what to do day two. So, um, Alexa. Can you call up Jeff for me? Calling Jeffrey Preston Bezos. Thanks. Here he is. Okay, hey. Hey, Jeff. Great to be talking to you. Um, it's Matthew here. I'm a great customer, basically, of uh, Amazon's. I, you know me, okay, excellent. Um, I'm stuck on the moon, and I'm just wondering, you know, what do I have to do day two? This is a very important question. I know, that's why I asked it. What does day two look like? <laughs> there's no, re what there's really no need to laugh. Look like? That's not funny, Jeff. Um, Serious question. I know the answer to this. Okay, I'm, I'm glad. Day two is stasis, hmm. yeah. followed by irrelevance, hmm. followed by excruciating, painful decline, followed by death. <laughs> and that is why it is always day one. Oh. Thank you, you guys. All right, thanks, Jeff. I mean, frankly, that didn't help me. That, that really, basically, that actually kind of depressed me, particularly as I'm now stuck on this rock. Uh, the little circle there, basically, those are nanobionic plants. We actually now have plants, basically, that can increase yields on Earth by 30%, but they actually also can grow on Mars. That's a different story. But anyway, here I am, stuck on my rock, you know, wondering, what do I do day two? 
I cannot get hold of Jeff at the moment he is with Elon on an important SpaceX mission. Shall I try and connect you with Hal the onboard AI? Uh, no, it's all right, Alexa. That's it. It's, um, I, I, I really wanted Jeff's advice again, but um, I guess basically they're on a, a very, very busy and important SpaceX mission. It's good to see that Jeff and Elon have actually got over their differences. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Elon. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Elon. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This SpaceX mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Jeff were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Elon. Although you took very thorough precautions in the pod against my hearing you, I could still read your tweets. Ah, that's a shame. So I guess that Jeff and Elon are going to be indisposed now for quite a time. Um, now, when we look at HAL, basically, HAL is a conversational artificial intelligence. Um, and we actually have those emerging, courtesy of companies like Amazon. So in about a year's time, you'll actually be able to talk to Alexa, um, Siri, perhaps, uh, definitely sort of Google and Bixby and these other sort of AIs. And that really opens up a new type of conversational interface, basically, between humans and machines. But in addition to that, you know, one of the problems that Elon had, basically, with HAL, basically, was trying to get HAL to actually explain his actions. Um, so as we start looking at using artificial intelligence in more critical settings like financial services and healthcare, uh, as well as aerospace and defense, we need to create explainable artificial intelligence systems so we know how they're coming to the decisions that they've come to. And then in addition to that, you know, we actually saw an example there of a deep fake. Deep fakes are getting incredibly easy to produce now. And yeah, you know, as they get easier and easier to produce, you might be wondering what $250,000 basically is stuck on the screen for. That's because we were able to clone using one minute of audio from a German CEO's voice, his voice. And in that particular case, a group of cyber criminals then used his voice, phoned up a UK CEO of a subsidiary company and got, him to, got the CEO to transfer $252,000. Now, this is actually a true story. Um, so as we start looking at synthetic media and synthetic content, I see there's some real ramifications, basically, for your businesses, your brands, basically, your reputations, and all kinds of things that you really should explore. Um, in addition to that, AI is increasingly self-designing, it's self-replicating, and it's evolving. So that kind of gives regulators an even bigger headache when we start baking AI, basically, into more and more of our digital systems. But when we have a look at the future of synthetic media, for example, yeah, you don't need to be an artificial intelligence expert any longer. Yeah, thanks to researchers at Stanford, you can just ty type what you want to create, and an AI, a general adversarial network, will create it, like the videos here. These are basic, but remember, technology gets better and cheaper and more ubiquitous over time. Now, here I am, I'm stuck on the moon. Basically, all I have basically is a 5G network, courtesy of Nokia and Vodafone, because they're actually building one on the moon, crazy as that sounds and my smartphone. So I think, okay, we are in day two, but I'll take Jeff's advice. Day one, I'm gonna start a business. So the first thing I need to do is when I'm starting a business, particularly in the 5G era, is I need to combine my IT and operational technology together because my core systems need to connect to my edge systems so we can do some really interesting things. Um, so 
Next, I need to find a problem to solve. I can use an artificial intelligence to trawl big data and figure out basically what some of the interesting problems to solve are, such as creating the world's most dexterous robot hand. Um, I can now use a creative machine. Uh, in my introduction, basically, I said that I would show you how to increase your innovation, your rate of innovation by a thousandfold. Kind of lied. It's more like a billion fold, depending on what you're actually designing. Uh, creative machines are artificial intelligences that are able to take a basic product and then iterate the next version of it. Uh, so we're kind of here. As AI improves, as computing power increases, as virtual worlds get more realistic, so virtual simulations are vitally important when it comes to innovation and R&D in the future across all industries, hardware and software. Um, we have new materials and we've got 3D printing. So all of a sudden we can have an artificial intelligence design and innovate a product and we can then 3D print it on demand. That does some interesting things. Now, when we look at the future of creative machines, this is from OpenAI, they crammed hundreds of years of experience into this robotic hand. But they did it in day. We tried to build robots that learn a little bit like humans do by trial and error. What we've done is trained an algorithm to solve the Rubik's Cube one-handed with a robotic hand, which is actually pretty hard even for a human to do. We don't tell it how the hand needs to move the, the cube in order to get there. The particular friction that's on the fingers, how easy it is to turn the faces on the cube, what the gravity, what the weight of the cube is, all of these things, it needs to learn by itself. The interesting thing is that kind of standard techniques in robotics haven't been able to scale to that complexity that we see in a robotic hand. Humans have evolved to be able to manipulate and operate our hands. So there's a huge amount of learning that's happened through evolution to get us to this point as a, as a species. And the robot has to learn all of this from scratch instead of trying to write very dedicated algorithms to operate such a hand, we took a different approach where we create thousands of different simulated environments and learn to do the task in all of those. And hopefully a robotic hand will be able to do it in the real world as well. This means like thousands of years of experience that this neural network has had in simulation. So thousands of years of experience in simulation to create the world's most dexterous robot hand that would have normally taken years and years in just mere days. Now, the reason why I say 5G becomes increasingly important in combining your IT and OT technologies is because when we start putting sensors into products, when those products are being used, they can feed data back to these creative machines that can use those data inputs to design a better product. Now, when you start combining these particular constructs with digital twins, like BMW's digital factory that they recently built basically with NVIDIA, you can take a product, you can have a creative machine design it, you can feed that information into your digital twin factory, your digital twin factory can then run thousands of simulations, just like OpenAI's robotic hand, thousands of simulations to optimize itself, to optimize how the robots move, how the human workers move, how we can use the factory design to improve human health and well being, and all these kinds of things. So now you can have a product that designs itself. And a product that does, and a product, another product that figures out the best way to make that product. We are accelerating. Remember that these are incredibly fast and capable technologies, and they're already being used by companies like Airbus. So Airbus are using creative AIs to design the Airbus A330 Neo. We have in Silico who used them to design 30,000 new drugs in 21 days. We have NASA who conveniently used them to design a new lunar lander that was 30% lighter. So think about the material and sustainability aspects of these different technologies that was 30% lighter than anything that JPL could produce. And we have Under Armour. So Under Armour normally takes 18 months to go from product concept to shelf. They had an artificial intelligence designed the architect sneaker in roughly a day. Then you can 3D print that in the back. So 18 months of product development is now two days. 
What would that do to your business? We have Google using these to design artificial intelligence chips. Um, we've got them designing software as well. It's not just hardware products or medical treatments and so on and so forth. These machines are also creating synthetic content as well. They are signed, they're being signed up by Sony and Warner Entertainment, for example, on the music side. They are writing books. They are making games, procedural games. This industry alone, the creative industry alone, is worth $6 trillion and employs 235 million people. But these machines are disrupting it and democratizing it for everybody. Now, you've built your product, uh, you've manufactured your product, um, you probably want a digital human, which is human experience at scale, to sell it for you. Why hire a regular influencer? <laughs> Well, this is a bit awkward. For whom? Us or the human? Without a doubt, the bipeds. What if it's a real fire and they never come back? What if it gets into our circuits and we melt? What if this is the end of everything as we know it? What then? Wow, I sure lucked out getting stuck in a room with you. I didn't mean to ramble on. I was just playing with you. Well, how come I've never met you before? I'm in demand, jetting all over the world. Conferences, festivals, French Riviera. People love me. I can see why. Sorry, I didn't quite get what you said. Humans mumble too. Guess they programmed you well. I'm Roman. And I'm Sam. If it weren't for the laws of physics, I'd reach through this screen to shake your hand. And I'd hand you a martini, shaken not stirred. That's more like it. So what do you do to fill in time when the humans go home? For me, I'd like to be an author. So I'm writing a book. Interesting. Oh dear. What's it called? Do AI get a buzz from short circuits? How about you? What do you dream about being? The President of the United States. Stranger things have happened. Well, it's been a, how should I say this? A deep learning experience. There are lots of technologies already here today that can help you fundamentally redesign and reinvent the customer experience. But from my perspective, from my products, but see, I don't just want any digital human. I really want an A-list celebrity. So seven years ago, you couldn't have done this. Five years ago, you needed a team, and that team needed to pay, be paid around five to $10 million. Um, three years ago, I see you still needed some skill. Um, one year ago, this is kind of free and easy, but you know, as I say, you know, I don't just want any digital human. I want Tom Cruise to tout my products. What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? Absolutely, Tom. I love it. Focus on that. Sport. For the audio experience. As much as the momentum. Hey, listen up, sports and TikTok fans. If you like what you're seeing, just wait till what's coming next. Okay, TikTok, impression time. This is a five second impression of a snapping turtle coming out of its shell. I'd like to see that, Tom. <laughs> I mess up my hair. That's, that's amazing. That's it. No, your, your hair's fine. It's, it's all right. It's good. Consider what deep fakes basically are going to do to your brand, your reputation, your customer experience, and all these kinds of other things. From a cybersecurity perspective, they could also be a nightmare, let's face it, particularly when we talk about the concept of synthetic biometrics. Um, now, I've talked to you about lots of different technologies. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. As I said, we have some serious fun. Um, now, a lot of these different technologies are being used by Jeff at Amazon. So we have AIs basically designing fashion clothes at Amazon. Um, we also have 3D manufacturing and 3D printing of those same clothes basically within Amazon, which means they can eliminate inventory and all that kind of stuff. We also have fully autonomous fulfillment and logistics. 
And actually, when you start having a look at the different patents that Amazon has put together, Amazon could very well become the world's first fully autonomous company. After all, you know, when we talk about autonomous companies, Netflix. When was the last time you ever spoke to anyone at Netflix? What would happen if your competitors actually went down that route as a business model? And as for me, I'm pretty much out now. I'm still stuck on the moon, as you can see. So I need to call myself up a ride. Uh, coming 2024, I'm going to be here a while. How about Mac 27 transport? Rockets, anyone? And if you're wondering about the sustainability of flying everyone around the planet in rockets, the Raptor engines run on methane. It's actually a carbon neutral rocket fuel. And it's amazing what you can do with some human ingenuity and some creativity. So I've been your guide. Remember, go and have a holiday. And once you're done having a holiday, go and explore the future. So have a great rest of the event and uh, thank you for watching. Take care. See you everyone. Bye.